So the first project I want to cover um, is, you know, we do a lot of personal projects at, at Fathom that really inform client projects, and they're based on curiosity. So, um, you know, this first project looks at the salary versus performance of Major League Baseball. So how much money uh, a team spends uh, in relation to, um, you know, their, their wins and losses. So, you know, uh, baseball is really all about a game of statistics. So this, this book that um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, Moneyball, you know, looked at, you know, looked at the story of the Oakland Athletics and particularly their, um, their manager, Billy Bean. And so uh, the Oakland Athletics were dealing with a really sort of uh, restricted revenue stream. So they looked at a, a different way of, you know, scouting players. So instead of going out and having their scouts look for the biggest guy or the biggest slugger or, you know, who is going to be a superstar, because they had a limited budget, you know, they really had to look at the nuance of uh, the data and the, the numbers that were going into it, you know, on-base percentage and, and different sort of factors that wouldn't go into, the, like, who, who the superstar was going to be. So um, obviously this, you know, is interesting to a, a company like ours. Um, and, you know, then this, that book got translated into a movie. And, you know, what was so, what was really interesting about this is like, you know, how do they make this translation? But what I found really interesting about the, that this movie, you know, was, was all set and ready to go. They had, you know, handsome Brad Pitt, you know, it was, it was like sort of surefire. But they had to go um, through a bunch of different screenwriters and, and actually multiple directors. And the movie really almost didn't happen. Um, it was, it was, you know, thought to be, um, you know, not the typical sports narrative. So, you know, we're looking at a, a sports movie um, based on statistics, and they couldn't quite see how that was going to work. So, um, you know, it wasn't the guts and glory type hero story about baseball. You know, they were really looking at, uh, you know, raw columns and, and rows of information. So. Uh, you know, I really love that this slide shows this whiteboard, you know, of, you know, just columns and rows of information. And I think this is, this goes to the audience factor, that this, this information is great for, for managers and scouts and experts. But, you know, what we think about is like, how could we translate that information, you know, into something for the fans or for something for the lay people? Uh, you know, that aren't into every single detail. How can we express this information in a different way? So this is a simple visualization we like to call just a sketch to get out an idea that looks, you know, that really looks at that, um, you know, the game, uh, the, the league, the team performance versus the amount of money they spent. So on the left here, we look at all the teams, you know, and, you know, all their records throughout the year, you know, across the top way up there. Um, you can look at a year-by-year -year, uh, range of, you know, 15 years of uh, uh, games, uh, 15 years of data here. And then we can also, you know, go into a particular year. So we can expand out and look game by game to see. So as the, the teams are going up and down, you can see their record changing and sort of their alignment to how much money they're spending. So here we're looking at uh, 2012, you know, the Boston Red Sox spent you know, uh, over $170 million on their team. And at the end of the season, you know, uh, came in dead last in their, in their division, almost, uh, you know, worst, worst uh, record in baseball. So uh, you can just see that, you know, this relationship that we might have a, uh, an idea about that they're spending, spending all this money to get the talent doesn't really pay off. So, you know, the Red Sox have done better and worse, but it, it, it shows that it doesn't really it really pay off here. Um, I, another view is, is looking at how can we split these things apart to make things a little bit more clear. So we're looking at, you know, the American League on the left and the National League on the right. And we can see at the top the Washington Nationals spent, you know, a mere $83 million, um, $81 million on their team, you know, and finished, and finished the year with the best record uh, before the playoffs uh, in the league. So uh, it's just an interesting way to look at a fairly complex data set and sort of compare two things uh, to tell a new story. So the, the next project that I want to show, um, you know, again, is, is based on, you know, our own curiosity and how we can explore data because, 
it's, it's not, uh, we're not in a field that, you know, people just give you content, they tell you what you want, what they want, and then you produce something. It's not sort of a traditional media like that. So for a number of years, we've been working with General Electric and, um, you know, working with a lot of different data sets they have. But uh, something that was really interesting uh, to us was the, they had this uh, great archive uh, in there, in the, the basement of the GE headquarters with all this information. So they let us explore that and just literally walk around and we were like, wow, they have, you know, 120 years of annual reports on file. And, you know, what, what could we do with that information? You know, it would be great to sort of express that in, in some sort of visualization. So we literally took all, of, you know, copies of all this original uh, annual reports and we brought them back to our office. We scanned each one. We digitized all the information. So we extracted the data in, in that fashion where we, we took the text and images and, 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 you know, through a lot of iteration came up with many different forms of, you know, expressing how can we look at 120 years of uh, annual reports, it's 5,500 pages, it's, you know, hundreds of thousands of words, um, you know, can we see, can we see patterns here? So this is just one of the, um, you know, one of, one of the expressions of this visualization. It's this large six foot by nine foot touch screen di display that's in the, the headquarters of uh, GE. So we're, you know, looking out from, from left to right, all those gray squares are the individual spreads of each page. So you can see the, all the 120 years of content. And, you know, a user can just walk right up to that without any sort of prior knowledge of what it is and just start exploring, navigating through that. And those red, you know, the red uh, squares that you see up there where he's, he's touching into is uh, a keyword, uh, you know, display of the word uh, manufacturing. So we took uh, the keywords that were used most often uh, throughout this piece that aligned with sort of the brand positioning of what GE wanted to talk about and, and sort of looked at, you know, what is a word like, you know, electricity? Like, when does that come up in the annual reports? When does a word like manufacturing Manufacturing is a good example because it sort of shows, you know, the spread from the very beginning to, you know, uh, you know, today's annual report, essentially. But we can look at the words like innovation and, and global and, uh, you know, aviation and where those things started percolating in through their system as the General Electric as a whole uh, changed. And, and it wasn't just about General Electric and, you know, their words and, and their messages. We could see, you know, world history happening as we, you know, ex explored through this. So we could see, um, you know, how turbine development, you know, was created in the 50s or advancements in turbine development. We can look at the use of atomic power and, um, you know, uh, we, can, we can look at sort of the use of the first computer with business. Uh, not to mention these snazzy jumpsuits that uh, folks are wearing and just the, you know, endless amount of retro photography looking at the General Electric kitchens and some of their beautiful Harvest Gold uh, ovens and, and refrigerators. Um, and, you know, beyond the experience that, you know, a limited audience had to see uh, this installation, you know, we, we, this was just for users to, you know, customers and, and employees of GE to sort of be impressed by this, this large scale, we wanted to open it up, you know, to the public. So we translated that same information and, you know, made it available, you know, in the palm of your hand. So this is a, an iPad app that allows you to explore all that information that we never, you know, plan for people to read 120 years of content uh, while they're standing there. But if they chose to, they could ex explore this way. They can look at the, the narrative in multiple ways. So, um, you know, we like, we like to say that when we could see that, that sort of far away view, which is, which is just showing the highlights, but then you get to explode into a particular, you know, page. You can, you can really almost see what we like to call as the forest and the trees at the same time. So being able to work with data in this, in this fashion, you know, allows us to see multiple views. Um, but it, it's, it's also not just about, you know, world history or a GE. This is just one example. I think, um, you know, imagining how you could look at different, different book series and, and fairy tales and 
um, you know, any, any sort of serial novels that, you know, could be expressed in a different way. And I'm not saying that the, the GE, you know, viewer is, is, uh, you could just plug that information in. But it's just a different way to think about, you know, how we, we look at these sort of, you know, beloved stories in a, in a totally different way and how we can use, you know, uh, data and information uh, and interactivity uh, to express that. So the next project um, comes from beyond looking at archival data, um, beyond looking at you know, data that's already collected, we wanna think about the, the data that we're all uh, producing you know, on a daily basis from our, our watches and our phones and anytime we're online, we're, we're generating all this data in real time. So um, you know, we've been working with Nike as well for uh, a number of years, uh, particularly with their, their um, their Nike Fuel, which is a metric to measure activity. Uh, you know, we, we had worked with uh, the Fuel Band, but it's any of the activity trackers, the Fitbit, any of those things that are collecting this data on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, it was really, it was still hard to, we did a lot of different stories to, um, you know, express what daily activity looks like, and they really wanted to see what does it look like in the aggregate, but even still to see sort of people's daily activity, it, it's pretty similar day to day. You know, you can see some cultural shifts around the world and how people move. Um, but we wanted to deliver a story that would, you know, be for a wider audience. So we thought about sort of these everyday activities of, you know, 24 hour tracking of movement and compare that uh, to, you know, daily weather. So we created this, uh, this website that looks at uh, Nike, Nike weather activity. So, Basically, what we're looking at here is a 3D map of the U.S. and the the larger, you know, and the taller the. Oops, sorry about that. I did the green, but okay, sorry. There we go. Um, so what we're looking at is, you know, the taller and the more green a state is, the more active they are at a particular temperature range. So this range is between 60 and 70 degrees, and not surprising. This is when uh, the, the country as a whole is the most active. Um, but what we're allowed to do is, you know, using, using the navigation, change the temperature ranges. Um, and we can see that, you know, so when, when it snows, when we look at uh, precipitation below freezing, you know, the whole country drops out and, and states that do measure snow, you know, really fall off. And e even states like Vermont, you know, which you would think could handle the snow is, is a bit below average, but still, you know, doing much, much better than, than everyone else. And then beyond looking at it at a, a nationwide level or, a, you know, state to state or regional level, we really wanted to give people access to their own data so they can see it as opposed to just sort of the, the, the regular, you know, checking their phone app and seeing sort of the same thing day to day or subtleties of that. We wanted to, you know, put those two uh, data components together, the weather and the activity, and see, you know, how individuals perform. So you could log into this website. This is actually looking at my uh, Nike Fuel data. So um, we're looking at a, the white line as the average, my average activity, and we can see that, um, you know, between you know 40 and 50 degrees, I have a 50% decrease in activity, which was really interesting to me at the time because, you know, that's just not really cold for folks from Boston or Pittsburgh for that matter, but there was a, you know, significant change. So immediately when you can see this data, you start wondering, you know, how can I change that or improve it or it's just opening up uh, a new way uh, to visualize this information. So there's obviously parallels to activity tracking and, and what uh, these bands are doing, sort of tracking uh, folks uh, throughout the park. And um, I think this is fantastic um, that, you know, there, we're creating, you all are creating sort of a frictionless experience. So families can go to the park, sort of pre-program some certain things. They can walk into a restaurant. They can, you know, have their food ready for them. They can get through the line faster. They can check into their hotel. But from what I've seen, I haven't seen like what does this data actually look like and, and how could we enhance that experience by giving uh, users access to this information so they can feel more in control of you know what they're giving out and I think that that is a problem with a lot of data that's uh, you know 
sort of handed over so easily so we get sort of minimal uh, response from it. But how can, how can we let users interact with this information? So then uh, the last project I want to show takes us back to the movies. Um, and, you know, this is probably the, the one movie uh, or movie series that is uh, the least analytical, uh, least sort of, um, you know, science-based in terms of uh, narrative plot. I think it's all about, uh, you know, guts and glory and all about the hero. So, uh, and, and that's none other than Rocky. So one of my favorite, one of my favorite movie series for a lot of reasons. Um, but one thing I always found interesting, and again, you know, a side project at work was, you know, how can we see, uh, the, it, it always seemed to me like the, the narrative structure was pretty much the same through all six movies. So there was always sort of like, that, you know, you know, the basic dialogue and then there was, you know, some sort of like, you know, down, down point in the movie, and then there was this epic montage, and then there was a fighting. So, the, you know, it seemed that they were always churning out that, that same story, but I really wanted to see if that hypothesis, you know, was true. So we created this app called the Rocky Morphology, and uh, folks were talking about uh, Joseph Campbell yesterday. This goes back to morphology of a folk tale. So how do you break down, uh, how do you break down a story into its most basic components? So what we're looking at is all six Rocky movies, and yes, there are six. I think people don't realize they came out with a sixth one. And e each one of these, I think the fifth one was actually worse, but the sixth, uh, sixth kind of got forgotten. So these timelines are the actual runtime of the movie, and then we're color coding those, uh, those different categories down at the bottom into you know, six basic things. So we're looking at dialogue, training, montage, pre-fight, fight, and even credits. So, um, you know, you can sort of see the patterns. I thought there was going to be a little bit more of an overlap in just in sort of the visual form. But what I found really interesting was, you know, you could, you could scrub through all these clips to sort of see six movies simultaneously with the relationship, but you could, you could also go in and select each one of these categories. You could watch the movie by credits or dialogue, um, training, you know, uh, pre-fight, which is that time sort of getting ready, Mickey's, you know, really getting Rocky pumped up. And then the actual fighting, you know, how much, how much actual fight time there was in the movie. And my favorite, the montage, you know, that, that, that breaking point where he's like at the bottom, you know, and then he has to really, uh, you know, have some epic song and, you know, he, he breaks through and he trains in the snow in, in Russia and then, you know, he essentially takes on the Cold War single-handedly <laughs> and, and wins. So, um, you know, this project was sort of, uh, again, what we would call a sketch and something that we do pretty quickly just because out of interest and, you know, get it out there. Um, it gained a lot of internet popularity, and this is one of my favorite tweets that came out. You know, finally, scientific proof, Rocky IV is the best, shortest runtime, most montage. <laughs> so, you know, this, this was, uh, you know, fascinating that the technology allows us to look at narrative in a different way, look at storytelling in a different way, but the technology also allows us to open this up to an audience that we, we never thought was possible. I mean, we sent one tweet out from our office that was, you know, announcing this, and we had, you know, over 250,000 hits in the first few days, and like almost melted our, our servers because we just weren't weren't really prepared for this. Um, so, you know, I see the application of of these projects and working with data and information, really working with the theme park industry in in three main ways. You know, so one to to inform the guest experience. So, if you know, if users are, you know emitting data or working with data to make their experience better, sort of make that more transparent, give it back to them and, and see certain ways. Obviously there's, um, you know, issues with uh, privacy and things like that, but I think there are other ways to, to give the user back the story. Uh, you know, and to interpret these stories, you know, these beloved stories in a new way, whether it's a fairy tale or it's a movie like Rocky, you know, how can we, how can we put a twist on these things? And then just to enhance these rides and experiences, you know, I really would like to see how this information could be embedded into different structures and not just on glowing screens, you know, not on these sort of, you know, just heads down things, but how can you actually express it, 
you know, in 360 degrees, and I think, I think all of that is possible. So, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, one or two questions. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, I have to leave a little bit early to get back to Boston tonight to see my family. So, uh, Linda asked if I could take a few questions. If anyone has one or two questions in the audience, uh, I'm happy to, to answer that. Right there. Yeah, uh, when interpreting big data, uh -huh. or, uh, common or um, I, w I would say, you know, we're in a really lucky position that when, when we work with clients that do have big data sets uh, to work with, you know, you really have to, to, you know, sort of build a simple tool that lets you see that first. So whether it's mapping something out, if it's, it's global data, you have to sort of um, really let the data tell you what's, what's happening there and, and never have a, a, an assumption when going into it. I think the, the most difficult times we have when working with clients is if, there is, um, you know, a client that tells us, here's the data and we, we want it to say this or we know it's, you know, going to be an aggregate and we want to see the community. Nike was a, a good example of that, that they really had particular sort of things that they wanted to get out of the data and it just didn't, it didn't work that way. So there was a learning curve, you know, when working with the data, but I, I think the first key is, is visualizing and not getting caught up in the, the technical side of it and getting bogged down, but if you can't see it, then you can't tell the story. Yep. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, we don't do a lot of modeling. I mean, there's certainly ways to do that. We, we really try to work with data that, we, you know, we can actually get our hands on. But, you know, we have been asked, you know, about, you know, how can we do sort of predictive modeling and things like that. That's not uh, something that we're doing currently. Um, and I think we're more interested in sort of the data we can get our hands on instead of sort of doing the statistical modeling. But, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's very interesting. But we worked with other groups that, that do that. Yeah. Uh, sure, one more? Okay. Uh, there you go. Uh, just a question. Do you think uh, big markets are really up to the data and reliability? Um, from my perspective, which is, you know, sort of limited when it comes to theme parks, I think that, you know, there are certain aspects that seem to be working well, but uh, I, think, I think there could be more to it. I think there could be more engagement to, to using the data because uh, I think there's, there is an archive of data of all the information just in terms of visitors and, you know, all the, you know, collection of hotels and things like that. But I think it would be good, you know, I think it would be, uh, you know, well done if, if it was shown a little bit more, but I just haven't seen a lot of, in, in my research, haven't seen a lot of that. So one more, I guess. Is there one more question? Yeah. Okay, that's it? Okay, all right. That's it. Sorry. Thanks okay, so thank much. Yep. James, everybody. <laughs>